Hello, my name is Martin Crowley. I'm a member of the French department here in the University of Cambridge and previously did the same job in the University of Manchester. My talk is going to be loosely organised around three events from 1979. One landmark publication and two small anecdotes from my own experience. So I'll start with the landmark publication. In 1979, French philosopher Jean-François Lyotard published La Condition Postmoderne, The Postmodern Condition. The subsequent fame of this work was, in a way, to its detriment for its significance was overwhelmingly taken in just one of the senses indicated by Lyotard, namely what he called a new incredulity towards grand narratives of historical explanation. This was often interpreted in a purely affirmative sense, as a kind of playful freedom in relation to monolithic forms of the legitimation of knowledge. What this obscured, however, was that Lyotard was also observing the advent of a new form, every bit as coercive as its predecessors. He writes, knowledge is and will be produced in order to be sold. It is and will be consumed in order to be valorized in a new production. In both cases, the goal is exchange. Knowledge ceases to be an end in itself. Now, this commodification of knowledge depends on the extent to which it may be measured against other commodities, according to a common standard. The imperative of this historical moment is thus, for Lyotard, assure your functionality, be commensurable, or disappear. No need to underline the foresight of this description in relation to the situation we're addressing today. I'd like to move into a rather different register now for my second event from 1979. I was 11 years old, had been learning French for two years, and found myself struck by just how hard it must be to be French. <laughs> Imagine, I said to my parents, if you're French, every time someone says vache, you have to work out that they really mean cow. <laughs> Now, if this memory has stayed with me, and I suspect it's because this marked the moment when I began to realise that this is precisely how things don't work. <laughs> or, to put it another way, that there is more than one language in the world. <laughs> but the gap of difference I was noticing is what organises the movement of meaning, with no reference to a single unifying code. The vache is not just a version of cow. There is no one-to-one -one correspondence and no gold standard, no possibility of converting one efficiently into the other without loss. They are, in this sense, incommensurable, as are word and object. That the same animal can be indicated by different words shows the two gaps that make meaning possible. I'd like now to think a little about such incommensurability and why it might be significant. Throughout modern French thought, but much more broadly too, we find the suggestion that this gap of difference offers a way of thinking about what makes us human. For concentration camp survivor Robert Antelme, for example, it provides the only genuinely universal definition of the human, from which no one can be excluded, according to which the human way of being is defined by what we might call exposure, exposure to everything we are not to language, of course, to other beings, and, classically, to our own mortality. In the work of contemporary French philosopher Jean-Luc Nancy, this exposure is called sense, the gap of difference that makes meaning possible, also makes possible the human relation to the world. So our human existence might in part be defined by these kinds of incommensurability, our exposure to the world and to the movement of meanings constantly different. As another contemporary French philosopher, Bernard Stiegler, has recently argued, when our participation in these processes is reduced solely to consumption of goods evaluated according to a single measure, then we suffer. The awareness of difference we can gain through studying and teaching in the humanities is in this sense more fundamental than the already important international cultural fluency these activities can bring us. The relation between the humanities and our well-being is not to be tacked on at the end of a list of potential social contributions after all conceivable material gains, 
nor is it something that concerns only the personal growth of individuals offered to them as a tradable good. We make meaning. We exist in our exposure to the movement of meanings. As such, if we want to flourish both individually and collectively, it is in our interests that as many of us as possible should be involved in arguing about and celebrating this movement. Not to cash it in later, but because the more intensely we are involved in these processes, the better off we are. Better off, that is, in absolute terms. Now, I promised you three events from 1979, so here's the third. In January 1979, I bought my first record, namely Hit Me With Your Rhythm Stick by Ian Jury and the Blockheads. Now, what I loved about this song was its euphoric patterns, celebrating music, language, and life as diversity and differentiation. It was, of course, a hugely successful commodity. It sold 979,000 copies, albeit on an independent record label. So lively affirmation of the movements of meaning is hardly confined to the academic humanities and can certainly pass via the circuits of consumer exchange. But the humanities allow us to understand these movements as irreducible to any single standard of value, and it is essential to our well-being that they should be understood in this way. <clears throat> For the sake, as the song says, of every woman, every man. And, as it also says, das ist gut, c'est fantastique. <laughs>